Okay, we are all set. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to week 14 of Inclusive Theater of Western New York's special Saturday series on inclusion in the arts. Uh, this week, we are super excited to have with us a very good friend of mine who I miss so dearly, and I'm so glad she's here tonight, uh, Shamika Andrews. Uh, just a little bit of background on Shamika. Shamika Andrews is a disability advocate and consultant. She provides resources to people with disabilities, their families, and community organizations. She is currently the Community Outreach Coordinator for the Self-Advocacy Association of New York State. The Self-Advocacy Association of New York State is an organization for and run by people with developmental disabilities. Sandy's helps people with developmental disabilities speak up for themselves and other, others. Also, Shamika is the author of the children's book, Butterfly on Wheels, and has collaborated with other author book projects such as Behind the Smile, 15 Women Who Survived the Storm. Shamika is a member of the Commissioner's Advisory Council of the New York State Office for People with Developmental Disabilities. She also serves where we met on the New York State Developmental Disabilities Planning Council or the DDPC, the Board of Catholic Charities Disability Service. Uh, she also has her associate's degree in business management from Mildred LA Business School. Um, and this was a really cool thing and I hope you'll talk a little bit about it as we go on. Uh, in 2006, Shamika won the title um, Miss Wheelchair after being second runner up in 2005. Miss Wheelchair America is an organization that promotes disability awareness and celebrates the accomplishments of women and girls in wheelchairs. In 2013, Shamika became the state coordinator for the Miss Wheelchair New York program. And when she is not working, Shamika, oh, we lost her, she'll be back. Um, loves traveling, listening to music, and going to Zumba and yoga classes. So some really, really cool things um, that she is involved in. So she will probably be right back. So just really quickly before she gets here, a couple of announcements. Next week, we have our readings of two plays by Donna Hoke. We will be reading Spirit of Buffalo, starring Erin Bellavia and Anthony Giambrone. Oh, there she is. Jess Levesque and Heather Benson. And we will also be doing survival strategy with Summer Harris and Andrew Zakari. Okay, and she is back. Well, that was fun. I dropped my computer. I was like, okay, that was quick. That was a great interview. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome, welcome. Oh, and there's Dallas. Dallas is here as well. Welcome, Shamika. Thank you for being here. I'm so glad to be here. I'm so glad to that you asked me, I'm so glad to see you and all of the things. Me too, me too. So I guess we can start really quickly. So um, we, we met on DDPC and which was so awesome. But during our time there, you wrote a book and I wanted to have a copy, but I'm still unpacking. Um, so it's probably in a box. And, so I, and, I, meant to, and, I, and I meant to go grab a copy, but you know, I can okay. still talk about it and people can go look for it at another time. But we can put the information on our website and all that stuff too. So send it to me after. But it's yeah. Butterfly and Wheels, bless you. And I was just wondering, you know, how and when you started writing and how, you know, you got this idea for Butterfly on Wheels. Well, all my life, pretty much, I have kept journals. You know, journal writing, you know, whatever I was going through, diaries, whatever you want to call it. So I wrote stories about, you know, um, you know, what was happening in my life and how I was dealing with it. But it was never really anything that I ever thought that I would share with anyone. Um, until maybe I was two, I was 2016, a friend of mine, um, who was a local, had a local um, publishing company, she was doing a book project and had said, you know, do you want to be a part of this book project? And, um, and that was the, the book uh, called uh, Behind the Smile. And um, so I said, yes. So I did a little thing in that. And then after that was done, she offered a workshop on writing, writing your first book. So I'm like, oh, okay. This is interesting. All of these things are coming together. So maybe it's, uh, you know, time for me to actually do something with all of these stories that I've been writing. 
So basically that's how it started. I took this workshop and it was all about, you know, creating your hook. How do you, you know, get people interested in your stories. And basically that's how butterfly and wheels, um, came together. Um, which was my first children's book. Uh, so it came out in 2017, which is crazy. It's crazy. Um, and basically the story, it's basically my story and what I was going through at that time adapted for children. So it's, it talks about, you know, the, the bullying that I experienced, you know, the loneliness of dealing with, you know, being a person with a disability, um, but it's written for a child and it talks about a butterfly instead of a little girl. And um, the reason that it's uh, about a butterfly and not a little girl is because I always um, connected with butterflies and saw myself, you know, going through the process that a butterfly goes through. I saw my life as, as that. So I always called myself a butterfly on wheels. Um, and the other thing is that I noticed lately, well, at that time anyway, and anytime I went anywhere, I always saw butterflies. Like when I went for walks outside, you know, I would see butterflies. Like even today I saw, you know, I was going for a walk for the first time since being locked down and everything. And I saw this beautiful orange and black butterfly that was on my walk. So that's a little bit of how it all kind of came together. Now, how has it been for you, like when you've met up with children or even parents who have read the books to their children? Like, it's got to feel amazing. But like, have there been any things that they've said to you? You're like, okay, that's, this is why I do what I do. Like those kind of moments of, aha. Uh -huh. Yes, I, I absolutely love, you know, working with children and, and seeing, you know, the messages come across my, you know, my page that, you know, so-and-so just bought your book or, you know, somebody left a mark saying, you know, my granddaughter loved your book and, you know, or somebody will post it, you know, everybody loves, you know, everybody should have this book. I, I think the, the like first surreal moment when it first came out was, you know, how uh, Amazon will send you like books you should read. And my book was on the list. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> Amazon just recommended my book to me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you made it. <laughs> know. It's like, you know, it was, that was just like the funny, a funny moment. I'm like, I get these lists all the time. And it's like, oh, I'm on the list now, you know. You are and it's on just, the list. <laughs> and, but, but just you know seeing you know as people post pictures and seeing children you know read the book or seeing it you know in a library we have where it because it, it's available in all local libraries and um you know seeing it on the bookshelf or going to a website and seeing it listed you know it's just really it's a it's special to me knowing that you know it's it's making a difference for, for children. Um, and it's a great book. I mean, it's, a, it's fantastic. And it's nice that children can see a representation of themselves in your book. I mean, I know it's a butterfly when we talk about those things, but to yeah. see a character that is like themselves right. is important. There's not enough of that representation. So that, I mean, kudos to you for doing that. Yeah, well, thank you. Yes, it, it really has, um, you know, uh, been a, a surreal like I said I can't believe it it's you know it's been like four or five years and I'm actually you know to the point where I'm doing some new workshops and 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 thinking about you know what's the next book you know I'm going to write that was and, my next question so well, how do you follow that up um yes um there is like I said I've been keeping stories for a long time so I have lots of stories and and ideas in my head um you know, it's, it's kind of deciding right now if, um, you know, if I want to do a follow-up to that book, or I, I also want to do a series for, for teens as well. So I, I'm trying to decide 
which one I really want to do next. Um, and then uh, also, um, you know, have an opportunity to get a book in front of a larger publisher. So I'm also thinking that with that opportunity, opportunity do I want to, you know, uh, do a brand new book or actually give the children's book an opportunity to get in front of because I self it's self published. So, um, you know, through this opportunity, I'm thinking that maybe in order to get it on a bigger platform that I would submit it to a, a larger publisher. But we'll see. Like I said, I have lots of lots of ideas in my head, but um, because I do want to, <laughs> yes. So I do want to do, there's a couple series that I want to do. I want to do one for, you know, a series, uh, like I said, follow up to the butterfly on wheels. And then I also want to do a, a series for, you know, like teens and young adults. So. On what topic or just general? Um, well, I have a lot of, I get a lot of questions um, about like, travel and relationships and things like that. So I'm think of what my idea is to do a series on, you know, like various topics, you know, that talks about travel and um, infuses a lot of my stories of, of dealing with, you know, traveling and going different places. And uh, so, and then also, you know, because of the different things that I've been through, I talk a lot about my faith. So I, I'd like to write write more about that. Um, so, I, like I said, I have a lot of lot of ideas in my head. It's just getting them, deciding where I want to go next. You know. Uh, so. For the hi, Shamika, my name I'm Dallas. Yeah, this is very inclusive. I was just wondering, what were some of the challenges in not only publishing the first book, but also getting those ideas on paper and some kind of general idea of what you wanted? I think I think the biggest barrier was was myself, really, um, is having confidence in myself to to do it and to put it out there and to, you know know that you know people will like it and not get it all in my head you know sometimes when we doing something new you know we're all in our heads about you know no one's gonna like this i can't do this sort of thing so i think that that was really the biggest challenge is getting through those voices in my head of you know i can do this i can be successful at this and because i i was really when i started thinking about the process one of the things that i kept thinking about because all of the stories that I write are journal stories and I'm, I have never really been a good thought that I was a good writer per se. Um, but everybody was like, just, just write your stories. Don't worry about it. You can get people to edit it and stuff. So I was really worried about like the whole editing part of it because you know, I just wrote stuff on, on paper and, uh, you know, didn't think that, you know, it was really any good. So it was just really kind of getting through all those voices that I had in my head and just doing it and taking steps forward. And then in the, you said you took a, a, a workshop. What were some of the things that you, I guess, learned or found out in that workshop and sort of said like, oh, I could use this. Well, yeah, I've taken, a, you know, a couple of different workshops that really have, uh, you know, took you through like, you know, how do you write a hook to a book? You know, what is, how do you attract people to your story? And how do you, um, you know, make an outline? And how do you do like, you know, something like a table of contents or, uh, you know, just really, you know, different pieces of putting a book together of, you know, and how do you just even start the process of just writing, you know, because a lot of the things that I started with are just free writing, you know, starting a pattern of, of writing every day, you know, that's what a lot of the different workshops told, 
told you to do and you know have have a a schedule and have a build a habit of writing a little bit every day and so that's the types of things that i learned in the in the workshops of you know building the habit not really worrying about you know the editing part because you can get there are people that are you know editors and that's their job and that's what they do and that's what they love to do so i can focus on you know just getting the thoughts on paper and somebody else can make it look pretty yeah <laughs> and now that you've sort of gone through that process do you think it'll be easier for the second book to just go through that again or do you think it'll be a little bit more challenging now that you because maybe there's those voices are coming back so now that you know a little bit more now those would come back with even more different type of questions and yeah i think i think the voices don't bother me as much they they still definitely come back but i i think i i'm less i'm less i can stop them a lot quicker and say no i can do this i did this before it's this is part of the process and so i think i've just gotten better at you know shutting them down quicker you know but they still come you know with every every step so how long did it take you to write your book the first one uh the, the first time it took about a year actually yeah that's good yeah. though yeah 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 so it took about it took about a year the whole process um took about a year to, to finish and then you know finding editor and all of that stuff so. well and i i appreciate very much what you're doing i don't know how much you follow some of the advocacy chatter on twitter and things like that but now you know there's this heightened or hyper awareness of uh bipoc folks who are getting out and and telling their stories because again we you know in advocacy we always talk about this that people have been telling our stories for way too long anyway but as a person of color taking that power back to yourself and why it's so important as a person of color to do that. Can you speak a little bit about that? Yes, definitely. This, this time, um, you know, and it, you're right, there, there has been, you know, more awareness to the stories of people of color. And, you know, for, I know for me, what I try to do during this time is not only share the stories of people of color, by people of color with disabilities, because I thought that that's the piece that was really missing from um, the conversation of, of, you know, putting people of color out there. It was that still that disability piece. Um, so I know for me, I always, I tried to, during this time of, you know, Black Lives Matter and all of that stuff, really uh, focus on the people with disabilities who are people of color that are out there that are, you know, doing, you know, whether it's with Black Lives Matter or whether it's, you know, essential workers with COVID or what, whatever the case may be, is making sure that those, those, you know, people with disabilities voices were also out there in the front, uh, forefront as well. And it's interesting because like going through some of the you know, work that's out there. I mean, you know, I teach disability studies and oftentimes, you know, you just do it kind of randomly, like you start selecting, but how many of these writers are just white writers? There's no black history. And now it's actually coming in, thank goodness. You know, we're seeing it with the disability visibility uh, book that was edited by Alice Wong. She's amazing. Some of other African-American advocates that are really stepping up and, and fighting for these rights through Crip Camp each Sunday. So, thankfully these are happening we still have a very long way to go but I, i'm so glad that you're doing that and that you are a voice for people who again like adding that part with disability who are virtually voiceless because it's either the story isn't told or it's taken away by a white person who's then colonized it and written it for a lack of a better analogy i guess mm -hmm. definitely yeah, and like I said, I've, I'm grateful for the opportunities um, to to be out there, uh, you know, because I, I mean, in my local community and, you know, on online somewhat, um, you know, 
as lots of people say, I know lots of people <laughs> and lots of people know me. Um, but I also try to, you know, let people know that I'm not the only one out there. So it's because I see it feel sometimes like in, in my kind of circle as, you know, because I do a lot of like non-disability things and connecting with non-disability groups that sometimes I'm the one that they're always reaching out to as far as disability, which is, is a good thing and, a, and, a, and not so good thing because, you know, just letting them know, you know, there are other voices besides mine. Um, you know, not that there's anything wrong with my voice, but sometimes I've, I've, I find that if I, you know, say, you know, did you talk to this person? You know, there's this, this thing of, well, are they like you sort of thing, you know, uh, and people, and it's like, well, everybody doesn't need to be like me. <laughs> so uh, they're all different voices and advocates doing this a lot longer than I, that I have that are out there. Um, so I, yeah, I just think that that's, you know, that, that piece is still very important, you know, with this past week, you, you know, celebrating, you know, 30 years of the ADA and, you know, all of the things that people, you know, like I said, that came way before me, um, you know, were doing and still doing and, and whatever, and the work continues um, because yes, we've come We've come very far, but we have so full, so much more to do, but grateful for all of it. Uh, so uh, listening to your bio earlier, um, was it the, I'm sorry, what, what was the, I guess pageant called Miss, Miss Wheelchair? Miss, Miss Wheelchair New York. Is, it's a program, it's a competition um, uh, for women who use wheelchairs. Um, I've, I've been involved um, with Miss Wheelchairs since 2005. And um, it's, it's an a advocacy um, and public speaking competition um, where women from all over the state come to participate, um, usually we would be have getting ready <laughs> for an in-person competition um, this year, um, but unfortunately, due to COVID, um, our in-person uh, competition was canceled because uh, usually this is around the time that our state our state title holder goes to national will be would be coming back from national um so anyways but uh like i said we have we usually have a yearly competition and women come and compete in a variety of uh categories it's not it is not a beauty pageant is there's no uh talent competitions or or swimsuit competitions or anything like that. Um, there's three uh, separate parts of the competition. There is your judging interviews where each girl has a 10 minute interview, kind of like this, but you're in a room. Uh, and the judges kind of ask you, you know, kind of get to know you questions, like what type of advocacy work have you done, things like that. And then the girls have to give a two minute platform speech on what their advocacy issue they will focus on for the year if they are selected. Um, and then they have to uh, uh, answer two on stage questions um, in front of the audience. So, and then they get a score after each of those sections. And um, whoever has the highest score goes on to represent New York, the national competition, which is usually held in the summer. Um, and that's a week long event. It's held in different states every year. And um, yes, it's, it's just, it's a great competition. It's a great program. Uh, it's taught me a lot as an advocate. I've met women from all over 
the country um, because of it. It was, it was how I got involved in, in advocacy. Um, I did my year as Miss Wheelchair in 2006. And then after my year was over um, at an event that I was at, the state court, uh, the regional coordinator of self-advocacy was at that event and offered me a job. Um, and so I've been with self-advocacy ever since then um, in a variety of different uh, capacities. But, and like I said, I once the coordinator, who was the coordinator at that time from this wheelchair, uh, step, decided to step down. She asked me to take over because like I said, I've been involved with the competition in a variety of ways ever since 2005. So it's very important to me. Um, we have a lot of women that have accomplished a lot and continue to accomplish a lot. Um, I was just gonna say our friend Katrina. Yes, um, Katrina. Graduated college. It was, it was a very empowering moment for her to win the competition, but also that momentum that she got from being built up by such a great organization has carried her through. I mean, yes. kudos to you guys for all of that. That's great. K Katrina, yes, Katrina is doing fabulous things. She's, you know, her, her platform was all about working with children in schools and she continues to, to spread that platform and, and talk about, you know, self the importance of self-advocacy in schools and, and having, you know, accessible playgrounds and, and, and children just being able to be children like, you know, everyone else and uh, be able to go to school. You know, she worked very hard to get her college degree while, while she was doing her thing as Miss Wheelchair and, yeah, she's, and she continues to do great things. And, you know, we had, um, you know, dur through this COVID um, thing, uh, and Andrea uh, Dalzell, who was Miss uh, Wheelchair 2015, you know, she's a nurse and she's doing all great things down in New York City as well. Um, she was just um, featured in Forbes magazine. Um, you know, so we have a lot, lot of ladies, the program, like I said, it's helped me do, you know, wondrous things and, and I have the opportunity to continue that and, and help other ladies that come through our program and see them go on to, to do really great things. So. And you have grown in the time that I have known you because when we first met, you were very quiet. You know, you shared things, but you are much more articulate. You know what you're saying. You know what you're, you know what I mean? Like everything with you has grown. And that's, I mean, credit to you because you're doing a lot of these types of workshops and, but also to you as a person, like you are, you know, hearing what's being told to you, you're taking that in, then you pair that with your faith, with your practices like yoga and the metaphysical things that you do. And I mean, I, I am literally blown away because I mean, I haven't seen you in a while. So to see, you know, how, how far you've come since, I mean, it's only been a couple years since I haven't seen you, but holy mackerel, like you should be very proud. I'm like, I am like blown away. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, la the last few years really have, um, have been, yeah, I mean, they've been transformational. Um, I've, I've worked a, a lot on, you know, uh, you know, just releasing a lot of, you know, old stuff, you know, old, you know, old patterns and old thoughts and, you know, childhood stuff and just really working on myself as, you know, because, you know, we're all, we've all been locked down. So, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> you know, not much else to do, but uh, I really, um, it really, I was, and I have been taking a lot of workshops, a lot of um, uh, different things. And one of the things that, that stands out for me during this whole process was I was watching an interview um, somebody, I don't even remember who it was now. Um, and they were like, 
everybody's talking about, you know, what's going to happen when this is over and what, whatever. And, and she said, I, I'm, I can't, I'm not responsible for what happens when this is over. I can't worry about that, but I can decide what I'm going to be when this is over and how I'm going to, how I'm going to be when this is over or, or you know, whatever that means. Um, so I kind of really took that to heart as really kind of focusing on what I needed to do to better myself. Um, so, yeah, so I mean, the last two years, really, I have been, you know, being out there a lot more and just kind of being out there with my story a lot more. And that's what, you know, what I'm really thinking about as far as, you know, the right, more writing and stuff is just really kind of, um, because I always, you know, people that saw me, one of the things that always, um, you know, stuck out to me and when I'm talk to people, it's like, they're always like, how are you so happy all the time? And how do you get, and then I was thinking about really like how miserable I was. <laughs> so, so it's like, I had this like outward, you know, smile and, and whatever, but I really wasn't as happy as everybody kind of thought I was, but that was what I put out because I didn't know how to handle anything else um, and how to handle all of those other feelings that I, the not happy <laughs> um, feelings that I was feeling that, you know, people weren't necessarily aware of because I didn't talk about it. Um, so, so it was just dealing with all of, all of that and, um, and really, you know, kind of trying to work through a, you know, how I can, you know, overcome that or kind of just not even really overcome it because it, you know, it still happens. So, you know, nobody's happy all the time, but um, just really be able to be fully who I am. That was another, somebody said to me the other day, because I was doing, doing a lot more videos and stuff like that. And I sent her a video and she, it's, you know, this was never an intentional thing really, but most of my videos are of me of my chest up, right? So don't see like my whole chair usually or whatever. And she said to me, because it was for, uh, she had a, it was exercise videos. And she said to me, she was talking about like my whole chair or whatever, but it kind of clicked to me in a different way, she said, we want to see all of you. And that, you know, she meant like me and the chair, but I, I took it even deeper of, you know, sh being able to show different sides of myself and that being okay. That's how it hit me. Um, so yes, I'm, there's, it's definitely not a, even know I sometimes I go on a tangent and I don't even know if I was even answering the question. Um, but I definitely um, recognize the growth in myself and know that I have have released a lot of stuff that I've was holding on to the last few years and that has definitely helped in growing me and being involved with organizations like you know Miss Wheelchair and Self Advocacy and DPC and uh, and all of these different really great um, organizations and I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to be able to work with so many different really great groups and you know I say it every day that I'm really lucky to have a job and have a career that I truly love every day and. I love the variety of it. And I love that, you know, every day is completely different from one day to the next. Um, because not many people can say and do say that they get up every day and they love their job. And, but I, I do. And I, I, re I still remember the first day, my first day at self-advocacy was out of school 
and we were doing a presentation and we were in this gym, school gym with 40 children. And they were all running around and, and it was me and somebody out of one of my coworkers who was also in a wheelchair and one of the little kids said, can you guys do wheelchair races? And we're like, sure, we can run around this gym with you guys, just like, you know. And so for like the next hour, we're just running around this gym with like 40 kids between the ages of, they were like five and nine years old. And I just was saying to myself, like, I can't believe that I get paid to do this. <laughs> and, you know, and get the opportunities to do so many of the things that I get to do on a regular basis. Well, and, and, you know, and a credit to you again. So you, one, like you radiate joy. And I, I'm not saying that as a cliche. I mean, again, I haven't been where we've spent time in a while, but you always were and always have been happy. And I think some of that goes to this idea that people expect people with disabilities to always be happy. So, cause then they leave us the hell alone, right? Like if you're pissed off, everybody's in your face, but when, oh look, there's Shamika and she's so happy and so nice when we're raging on the inside, right? Like that's just something we adapt to one of those weird things. But, you know, to, to speak to that development and just seeing that like that joy is you. And I think that's just so beautiful. And I'm so proud of you. I mean, I think it's just amazing. So kudos to you. Um, I do have a question uh, from Matt Boyle for you. Um, he notes um, that you, of course, your disability is spina bifida, right? So um, oftentimes babies are diagnosed when the mother is pregnant right. with spina bifida and then they're aborted, okay? Because they feel like, whatever, this old antiquated idea that there's no quality of life, blah, blah, blah. Do you, what Matt wants to know is that, is speaking for the unborn part of your advocacy work, you know, for those folks who might be considering doing that because of these old thoughts. Um, and he, you know, he points to some of these um, reviews that were posted decades ago, talking about termination of pregnancy. like here we are in 2020 and people are utilizing data from 1999. You know, that's extraordinarily problematic. It was then too, right? But 2020, like, so I will just turn that to you. Yeah, I mean, this, this types of thing, it continues to be an issue. Um, I, I remember back when there were stories in the news and I don't, I don't, I don't even recall the woman's name now, but there were a lot of stories about doctors operating on people um, that were, you know, incapacitated or incapable or whatever, whatever word that they were using. Um, and, you know, how people didn't understand that this, this type of thing was very problematic um, for people with disabilities in general. Um, and I think it came up again with this whole COVID situation um, with people being hospitalized and not at first being able to have somebody there with them, you know, that this type of thing would continue to happen of, you know, just operating on people or not treating people because you felt, oh, well, you know, they're really sick or whatever. Um, so, you know, they, you know, if they die, you know, whatever. Um, and, you know, that continues to be the pattern that you see now, online and, you know, I think it's more visible with the whole online thing is, and it is something that we need to continue to debunk of this whole thing of, you know, having a disability is misery and you're better off dead. And, you know, this idea of, you know, it, it saddens me like every time you, you know, this, hear this, um, you know, the arguments for, you know, assisted suicide or something, you know, along those types of things, you say, well, that person was really sick. So, you know, thank God that they were able to kill themselves. But if it was somebody, you know, that didn't have a disability, it's like, oh my God, how could they do that? You know, what? 
but if it's a person that has a disability, it's like, oh, well, now they, they're in a better place now. So that that's okay. And it's like, well, how, how is that? You know, we have this very weird antiquated thing about what we think is okay for certain types of people. And, and I don't quite understand it. And, you know, it's like, okay, but it's like suicide is not okay for regular people, so-called regular people. But, you know, if somebody with a disability wants to kill themselves, you know, then, then, then that's, that's fine. And well, in Texas, right, for the gentleman that was refused care, and basically they just told his wife, well, he's disabled, so he doesn't have quality of life, which we know is nonsense. Right. Uh, yeah, so it's like these things, you know, continue to happen. And I mean, I know, again, you know, as far as like the gratitude for my life, you know, because where I, when I was born, I was born in, in the se late seventies. And at that time, people with disabilities, basic um, people, not with disability, people specifically with spina bifida. Um, if you were diagnosed with spina bifida at that time, basically your prognosis was death. Like well, yeah, they, there's a quote that you said they told your parents you weren't going to be past five years old. Yeah, I wasn't right. I wasn't going to live past you know five years old. I'm now, thank God, I'll, I'll be you know forty two. You'll be sixteen next year. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I'm exactly. Um, uh, so you know, it's this. You know, this continues to be an issue of you know, people seeing disability as less than, as, you know, you must be miserable. Oh my God, I'm poor, poor, pitiful you. And, and I say this, like people with disabilities, every, like society as a whole, puts you in one of two categories. It's either poor, poor, pitiful you, or you're superhuman for leaving the house today. And it's like, why can't I just, you know, just go to the store and, you know, I, you know, I jokingly post this sometimes. It's like, did anybody clap for you when you went to the store today? It's like, like who does this, these things? And it's like, I'm just going to store, buying bread like everybody else. It's not, it's not, you know, it's a little bit more in detail now with the whole COVID situation, but I, I still don't deserve an award for doing it. You know, it's, it's just, it's just a thing. That's what you do. You need some bread, you go buy it, and, and that's it. Doesn't make me a superhero. Doesn't mean that I'm, you know, any better than you. I'm just going to buy bread. You're an inspiration. That's <laughs> the word, right? Like, <laughs> I bought bread. I'm an inspiration. But... <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, and like you said, it's like, and if you're not, and that's the thing, if you're not happy and you're not, and if people approach me, with this whole, oh my God, I'm so proud of you. And then if I have any more bit of an attitude, it's like, well, what's wrong with you? Like, you know, what, or if I yell at somebody that decides to pat me on the head that day, it's like, well, you should be lucky that I even said anything to you because, you know, you're in a wheelchair and nobody wants to talk to you anyway. So, you know, it's like, am I going around patting you on the head? Like, why are you touching me at all? You know, and, there's this, this whole attitude of, you know, I should be grateful that you even spoke to me um, because I'm in this chair. And really, it's just, it continues, like I said, um, to be a thing that we really, we really need to continue to advocate for and continue to share stories and continue because it is, it's still out there. And, you know, like I said, it's resurfaced. It's really more out there now. With this whole COVID situation, um, you know, and people just, you know, thinking that, you know, people with disabilities lives are not important. So it's like if they, you know, get sick or they need a operation or whatever, it's like, oh, well, we're not going to bother because, you know, they're, you know, whatever. Um, you know, and when I do, when I speak to, because I do a lot of, you know, trainings in hospitals and things like that, but at least before this whole COVID situation, um, you know, it's like, it doesn't matter what the person's disability is. You, you go in there and you treat them like you would want somebody to treat your mother, like you want somebody to treat your sister, but it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if they 
can speak like me, so to speak, or whatever, however they are. It's like, even if they're a nonverbal person, you should still be communicating with them like you would communicate with me. Don't just ignore them because you feel that they don't understand you, whatever. You don't know what they understand. So you should be treating them like you would want somebody to treat your mother, your sister, your brother, whoever. It's somebody that was related to you that was there in that house. A friend of ours, Chris, and I, I'm sorry he's not here tonight. Um, he often, you know, he's married and he said oftentimes that when he meets people out, they don't even talk to him, they talk to his wife. Now the first thought in their mind is that that's not his wife at all. It's a care worker, right? Like, of course, how dare you get married? But also there, it's almost this, you know, kind of you alluded to the dehumanization. You know, why would I talk to you? He's not gonna understand it anyway. And that's really sad because that's not at all true. And, you know, you work with many advocates and you know, as well as I do, you know, that there are people that are quite capable of making their own decisions and do so very well. They don't need guidance and they don't need those pats on the head, yet somehow culturally it always comes back to this infantilizing of people with disabilities that, you know, you're always a child you couldn't possibly grasp it even if you do grow up. And that's really problematic, but it's reflected on the person. I mean, and that's why this is such a hard thing to combat, right? Because it isn't something ingrained in us in the society. They're taught this behavior. So how do you change that behavior with individuals who aren't hearing things? You know, we talked about Black Lives Matter, and then we still have these people, all lives matter. You know, there's always this person that has this other trajectory and if they're not willing to listen how do we then change that and I, I don't know that's you know a rhetorical question but you know maybe you have some insight on how we can at least begin to address that if not anywhere else but in the arts because that's where we have this kind of open space I, I think unfortunately there will always be those people <laughs> and but I think we can by sharing the stories, by being out there, by making sure the people that are, you know, that are advocates, that are singers, that are artists, that are whatever they're doing, that their stories are being told. Um, and, and that way we, we chip out away at it, at least. I unfortunately don't think we'll ever get to the point where it's completely not an issue. Um, but I think those things help chip away at it. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely, uh, like, like you said, um, you know, things like that, you know, going out and, you know, if I'm going to a new place, you know, I always, you know, have to laugh at the, you know, the person around the corner that I'm on the uh, back in the counter will go, is your mother here with you today? Oh, it's like, uh, no. <laughs> actually, she has. Like, what? <laughs> it's like, no, actually, she's not. And I haven't gone anywhere with my mother in 15 years. So it's, I, I, no. Um, yeah, so it's like things like that. You just, you have to continuously, you know, advocate and, and share the stories and combat and say, no, actually, that's, that's not really how it is. And, and some people will listen and some people will get it. And then, you know, because of the magic of the internet, there's always those people that will never get it. Um, but just to flip this back over to another side, and maybe you can help us, you know, one of the things that we are kind of plagued with and inclusive is people with disabilities and people of color and people of other groups, whatever. They're so used to being told that they cannot do something that when it gives opportunity to do something, they don't show up. And I've heard it from some folks, like, you know, particularly because of my work with disabilities, you know, well, I'm told that my day ends at five o'clock, I'm supposed to be home, things bad happen at night, so I can't go to rehearsals, blah, 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 you know, um, things like that. <clears throat> but also just that, well, no one's ever given me a chance before, 
I'm not even going to audition because they're not going to give me a chance anyway. And we are not that. Like we give everybody an opportunity. And if you aren't where you want to be, we stretch that to include classes and things that will help you become the actor or director or whatever it is that you want to be. But what we tend to, to confront regularly is people showing up, quite frankly. And I don't know how that, I mean, and if you have ideas, you know, again, I think it's chipping away at culture, right? But how then do we harness that to let people know that we want their stories, we want their voices heard? I think it's, I think it's hard. Um, and I say this a lot in the, because in the system right now with all of the changes of really focusing on, you know, individualized services, you have, have these different service systems, you know, reaching out to people and having conversations with them about things that they never had the opportunity to discuss. And I think it's difficult for people to be able to have confidence in themselves to think that they can pursue something that they actually like. And, and I think that, that that's where it starts is the confidence because there, there are, and like I said, and with myself, you know, having those voices in your head, having people from the day you were born give you a list of things that you will never, ever be able to do. And it's hard to combat that. And you t and eventually you hear it so much you take it on. And that and that was part of the thing for me for the last two years of letting go of all of those stories that I heard. You know, one of the um, the lines that I wrote in the store in the book um, uh, behind the smile was how I began the story was. How do you learn to love yourself when you feel that you've been rejected since the day you were born? And I think it's there and that, and I think a lot of people feel that because, and so it's hard for them to shift into a different, you know, with like, the disability systems, right? I always said this when we're talking about employment and its services. It's like, well, people that don't have disabilities, they they get to have a job and a career and a house and and people with disabilities, we get to have a bed and a placement and a and a you know a, you know a program. We so it's like it's all about how people talk to us and about us and what we are choosing to take on so i think it's all of those things and then that produces what actions you are going to take or not take and you know that affects of whether you're going to show up you know are you going to show up and what does showing up look like because in most cases, you're depending on somebody else to help you show up. So, if, and because that's what I've seen also in the disability system, where you have people with disabilities that sign up for committees or sign up for different things, but they're not showing up because they're not being supported to show up. Because they need to be supported to show up. And if the people that are supporting them don't feel that it's necessary, then they're not going to be able to show up. So that's a that's a whole another <laughs> that's a whole other issue. Um, so because that's what I see a lot of is we you know we want to have people with disabilities out there more and they want to be out there more, but if they don't have the supports to be able to do the things that they need to do, then then they can't. So. So I think it's all of these things because I've, I've seen it and this is why I tend to travel alone a lot just in society as you, you see me because 
I've in the past, I've had issues where I've needed help or I need, or wanted or requested help or just requested a companion to an event or something. And they spent the time, you know, complaining about it. And it's like, well, I might as well do it by myself. And you, you go do, you know, whatever, instead of knowing that you're, it doesn't matter whether you like the thing or not. Your, your job is to help somebody and support somebody to do the things that they want to do. It's not about you and what you like. It's about that. <laughs> so that's, that's your job. So, and, and that's like 5,000 different things that I just talked about that I could talk about forever. Um, so, it's, so it's like all of the pieces together. And I think that really just like the confidence in knowing that you can do it. One of the quotes, and I just read this at our, our Saney's um, weekly meetings that we had, it's a quote that I love to use in a lot of my presentations. Um, uh, and it's by an author called, his name is Edward Everett Hale. And it's, and the quote is, I'm only one but still I am one. I can't do everything, but I can do something. And I won't let what I can't do interfere with what I can. And so I think that that is, like I said, that's, that's the very important piece of just knowing you can. And knowing you can show up, and knowing you can ask for the support you need to show up and that you will receive that support to be able to show up. So it's all those pieces all together. <laughs> That's an easy answer like everything else, you know. <laughs> so before we let you go and thank you for, for joining us. And I guess this question can go out to the whole group, but as you guys were we're talking or as you ladies were talking it just sort of maybe think about like people of color and how advocacy for people of color it's predominantly predominantly been just people of color doing the advocating but i guess something happened in 2020 where a lot of people started to get the message like it clicked like oh wait we we all need to be a part of this and i'm just wondering what is the advocacy like for people with disabilities like has what, what, what will it take for that, I guess, 2020 moment for everyone to sort of get that same message that, oh, it's the, it's the same formula that we've been trying to work on with people of color, the same with people with disabilities. We just have to, we just have to treat people better. That's it. Right. And, and we have to get over the, uh, people have to get over this thing of disability issues affect this group over here, this tiny little group over here. Well, that's their issue. It's not a their issue. It's everybody's issue. Our issue. That's, yes. Yeah, it's, it's everybody. And, you know, it, I've heard it said many times over the last few weeks, disability is the one group that anybody can join at any time. And everyone needs to realize that. It, we can, uh, it's not, a, that's their problem over there. And that's, and that's, I think, what the problem is. And even as you see, you know, all of these different movements coming up and, and different things like that, again, disability is on the back burner. And I say this to every group that I talk to every day. No matter what you are talking about at this table, whatever table you're sitting at, disability needs to be a part of the conversation. Access needs to be a part of the conversation. It doesn't matter if you're talking about education. It doesn't matter if you're talking about homelessness. It doesn't matter if you're talking about housing or transportation or LGBT issues. Disability needs to be a part of every single conversation and once everybody realizes that then we will be there yeah and i will add to that just two quick things people with disabilities or the disability group right 
is the largest minority in the world. Okay, not even in the US, but it is, but the entire world. And there is so much power within this group that if our group ever realized how much power that they had, God help everybody. Okay, so that's one. The second piece to that is that every single person, unless you get hit by a bus one day and just die, every single person will be disabled at some point in their life. Glasses are assistive, right? That's a disability. Our aging population is growing by leaps and bounds. Every single person. So to speak to your point on this isn't an other problem. It is an us problem because we're all going to be there. The problem is, is that people think that they're not gonna get old or that they're not gonna break their leg and end up in a wheelchair for six months or whatever. But the reality is to Shamika's point, we're all going to be there. So it needs to be unified, non and disabled. And we need to come together very much like you were talking about Dallas with the allies and people, because we are all each other's allies. We just have to treat each other respectfully and value each other as human beings. And somehow we've gotten so caught up in stereotyping and labeling people that we've forgotten that the ultimate piece of who we are are humans. And that's like what Bernice was saying a few weeks ago. You know, we, we're human beings. Exactly. We divide by color, we divide by sexual orientation, we divide by ability level. It's meant to be divisiveness to keep us apart. Because when we're separate, we don't have as much power as we work together and have it. So going forward, we really do need to come together. I don't know how you get there. We're seeing it. And disability is always like the afterthought, right? But we know it has to be at the table. So too does mental illness that we're suddenly, you know, forgetting about. That's a huge part that we need to be talking about more and more. But where do we go with that? And I think we have a lot of work to do but everybody needs to come to that table because if all the voices aren't representative, whether it's in the arts, in schools or whatever, if they're not being representative, then you're not doing total accessibility, total access to everyone. You're just fulfilling what you think somebody else needs. So. Exactly. exactly. And I think, and I think the other thing is, is about being at the table is, don't necessarily, I think sometimes we, we're waiting for the invitation to be at the table. You need to ask to be at the table. You need to knock on all the doors and get at the table. And if they're not inviting you to the table, build your own table and, and, and have those people be around. We, we all need to be at the table, whether it's a table we build ourselves or a table that somebody uh, else has already started. And that's, that's the thing about it is, is being at the table. You're not going to always be asked to be at the table, but you need to stay up here and say, hello, we're over here. We're not going anywhere. And you need to listen to us. So, you know, it's just, you know, it's this is one of the cool things when I first met you, I remember you going into a library for a class, right? Like that was one of those things you, and that's what I think is so amazing. Like most people would be like, Oh, I don't know if I could go in there. Like, no, it needs to be accessible. And I'm going to get in there and I'm taking the yoga class or whatever it is. And you've always been so infused within your community. And I think that's key too, because when people see you, they can't say you're not there. And, you know, everything that you're saying about making and being at tables, you embody that. And hopefully people that watch this or learn from you with your books or whatever, realize that you don't just write about it, you put it into action. And kudos to you, because that's what's necessary to make change. We can't not go out at five o'clock because OPW says it's dark. We go, we find somebody to take us. We go there with our friends safely. We return safely with our supports and we have a good time and we're in the community. That's key. We've been isolated for a long time from each other. And unfortunately, COVID took us to another weird place. Um, and that will continue to impact who we are. But thank you for being an example of not only what you write about, but what you speak and what your truth is. Because a lot of people do talking and don't act. And since I have met you, you have always been a woman of action. And I 
am honored to know you. And I'm so grateful for the things that you do, not just in a disabled world, but in the world as a whole. We need many more Shamikas. And I, I'm just grateful that I have the privilege of knowing you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you for being here tonight. We appreciate you. The hour goes so fast. We're actually I, I know. I was, I was, I couldn't, I looked up and I was like going on and on and I'm like, oh my God. It's like <laughs> Time goes fast, but I do want to talk to you in the future, possibly about adapting Butterfly to the theater. Maybe we can have a conversation about that. Um, yeah. If you're ever interested in maybe having a workshop, we have some people with Inclusive that have been talking about wanting to get back to writing, um, but we don't get together because of COVID, but we can do it on Zoom. Um, so we would love to have you and I will make sure that we, we stay in touch and thank you for, for being here, for sharing your knowledge and just for, for sharing you because you are awesome. Well, thank you for the opportunity. It was so nice to, to see see your face as I, I don't get to see you at, anymore but uh it was nice to, to see you on here and i'm grateful and thankful for the opportunity dallas do you have something there was paper up i didn't know if you were sending me sos's oh no i was oh. turning my light it got dark <laughs> thank you Thank you so much. So really quickly, next week, we will have our readings from Donna Hoke. I mentioned them briefly. Spirit of Buffalo, starring Aaron Bellavia, Anthony Baldwin, GM Brown, Jess Levesque and Heather Benson, directed by yours truly and Dallas Taylor, and Survival Strategy, starring Summer Harris and Andrew Zakari, directed by Queen Robinson. We will be live streaming them open for questions, um, but we'll be performing both live next Saturday, the 8th at 8 o'clock. So have a great week, Shamika. Thank you again, and we will see you very soon. All right, take Bye -bye. care.